Good, brilliant. Well, we've got a fantastic panel. I can't believe we've got all these amazing reward stars up here in front of us for the final session to give us their top tips on, uh, on, on technology. So let's introduce them first, because uh, there's always a danger of me forgetting to do introductions uh, by, the, by the stage of the, the, the game. So next to me here, you might recognize um, Nadine McLean, who is UCI Reward Manager at Shared Services at Computer Share. Um, she's reassure, reassuring me because she moved from a different job somewhere else where I knew her for a very long time. <laughs> uh, next to her is Ken Laurie, Head of Reward at EasyJess. I'm sure many of you have seen him speak before. In the centre, we have Jamie King, who's Director of Global Reward at XExec. So he's our supplier on the team, so he's coming from a slightly different angle. We'll come back to him shortly. Then next to um, Jamie is Fiona Buchanan, who's Executive VP HR, so HR specialist from Causeway Technologies. And then right at the end, we've got Caroline Adam, who's Head of Benefits EMEA for Bloomberg. Again, many of you will know Caroline's come to many of our events. What I've asked each panelist to do, um, just slightly different to how we did the panel earlier, but I've asked them to think about their experiences of putting in technology. And I said, you can either think of several projects, you know, your general experience or a specific project, but can you please think about what did you learn from that? What were your learnings? What were the pitfalls? What were the pros and cons? So I've asked each of them to think of sort of three or four minutes and talk to that. And once they've done that, we'll get the Slido questions up and see what you guys are, are going to tax them with at this late stage of the afternoon. So, good challenge there. So, Jamie, can we start with, with you? Yeah, okay. So, we're, I'm going to speak about five tips that we've picked up from some of the relationships that we've had as a supplier of technology um, for our, our clients. Um, the first tip is to make sure that technology that you're adopting works for you, um, that you're choosing technology at the right level and the right kind of technology, um, because there are ways in which technology obviously won't work for you. Um, some examples of that are in the project and budget sense, of course, because often we see organizations who will spend 80% of their budget and time, indeed, in implementing a piece of technology and bells and whistles and um, uh, gold-plated features and functionality, etc., cetera, um, which only delivers 20% of impact, for example, the old 80-20 rule. Um, and there are many reasons why uh, organizations think they need something. Um, it may be because they've run some employee engagement questionnaire and their employees are telling them that they need something. Uh, even employees sometimes don't necessarily get it right. I know we're all here listening to our employees, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because you think it's either trendy or cool or useful um, that it should necessarily be implemented. Uh, a good example of that actually is one of the topics that's been discussed today by earlier sessions, and that is the use of AI or personalization. So personalization is seen as to be a good thing. The idea that we can use data from one area of an individual's life and apply it to another area of their life is seen to be a good thing. However, depending on your staff demographic, that might be quite unsettling for some employees. And we've seen that with some of the programs that we've been involved with, that some demographics actually don't like the idea that you're using that data to know which cinema they go to, where they're shopping, which supermarkets they're shopping at, etc. So that might be a demographic thing. Sometimes it has to do with um, other forms of uh, over um, indulgence in technology. We see, for example, some uh, requests with us to integrate with all of their systems. So we'll integrate with the HR system, okay. We'll integrate with a payroll and finance system, okay, maybe. Uh, we integrate uh, for a certain type of product with fiscal fraud management systems and intranets, etc. And very often we uh, get a, a little bit down the line in the project and we realize that those integrations weren't, again, worth the effort and cost, perhaps. Again, it's just something to look out for. Um, the second point is about early stakeholder buy-in, which is really a general point about management, project management generally, of course, that we want to make sure, you want to make sure that um, we have the key stakeholders who give their decisions and buy-in and input as early on in the project as possible. Um, and that then soon after that stakeholder buy-in, you move quickly to make the project as lean as possible so that quick decisions can then be made through production stages. Um, and there's a famous Fred Baker quote that um, it takes one woman uh, nine months to have a baby. That doesn't mean necessarily that it takes nine women one month to have a baby. Um, throwing people at a project actually obviously can actually do more harm and damage sometimes. The third tip is um, giving right prioritization to the right parts of a technology project. Um, very often we see 
at the, what's called the fuzzy front end of a project. Um, months and months, sometimes years spent in this phase of the project, getting buy-in from, from uh, stakeholders, from the finance team, um, authorizations, defining what your vision is, uh, allocating budget, because can sometimes take months and years. And then they leave a week and a half for UAT testing or the actual product itself. Um, again, thinking through the project from beginning to end. Projects begin and not when the supplier comes in and starts building something for you. Projects obviously begin um, at those very early stages. Fourthly, um, we, um, we often see um, SLAs put into contracts which sometimes don't work for the uh, clients for our organization because they pick up the SLA from an existing contract on another technology project. And it's worth thinking very carefully about SLAs. A good example of an SLA which may not work for you is the insistence that the provider uh, um, resolves all issues within a very specific or blanket time period. So all issues need to be resolved within 24 hours. We've seen those in contracts. But that can work against you, of course, because not all issues can sensibly be resolved in that amount of time. And it's worth thinking about your SLAs perhaps more uh, subtly. The last point I wanted to make um, was to not overuse technology so that you end up dehumanizing the end result and the end service. And a very good example of this, we work in uh, engagement and uh, benefits and recognition, and particularly in recognition, we see this with um, employee recognition schemes. One of the buzzwords uh, in employee recognition at the moment, or actually it's an old buzzword already, and that is social recognition. The idea that we should socialize and celebrate achievements and awards beyond the nominator and the nominee by spreading the word, by socializing the, the notification of the awards to colleagues and friends, etc. And through your use of all sorts of digital technology and widgets, winners ball, winner walls and messaging systems and message panels and corporate messaging systems and e-cards and all those sorts of things, and digitizing the entire process. Um, but it's worth remembering that sometimes the best form of social recognition is good old-fashioned face-to-face face-to-face recognition, i.e. handing a card to someone at a team meeting, a handwritten card, putting up some balloons, handing someone a plaque, etc., getting the team uh, around the individual and clapping so that you can hear the team's actual um, social uh, um, celebration and not just putting it all through uh, digital platforms. <coughs> Thank you. Some really good points there. I see lots of people scribbling down notes. Nadine, you're up next. Lovely, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to talk about a very specific uh, project that I've been working on recently, which was a central employee hub for our employees. So this is about taking all our component parts of our total reward package and putting them in a central place for employees to access. So we did take quite a, a holistic approach to this. So it was looking at recognition, online learning, flexible benefits, access to our pension and our share scheme as well. But again, very importantly through that central uh, platform. What worked really well for us was having a documented business case. So this was going about clearly defining what our objectives were, what the costs were, what the return investment was, and we used that then to engage with our stakeholders. Um, as Jamie mentioned there, it was really key to get your stakeholders on board right from the outset of the project. So this is your IT teams, your senior leadership teams, and your internal communication teams, and your employees, importantly. Um, one of the key drivers for us was to look at providing this platform both inside and outside the workplace. So it was great that we had kind of alignment to our overall HR strategy as well, which is really about trying to bring a consumer grade experience into the workplace. Um, if I had a time machine, if I could turn back time and say what would I do differently, employees are a really valuable resource or source of information for you but we typically tend to use them at the outset of the project or at the very end so we understand what they're feeling about today's packages or today's programs and then we usually see whether we've improved it and I think actually we could have used them throughout the whole entire project life cycle so we could have used them when developing the platform getting them on board with UAT and then in turn turning them into champions really within the business so uh, that would be my, my top things to do differently um, in terms of avoidance, um, probably over complicating things, I think we work already in really complex organisations. We've got hugely diverse workforces, and then on top of that, we tend to overlay policies, 
eligibility criteria. And the more kind of variables you put on your technology platform, the harder it is for you to administer. So at the end of the day, data's got to go into the system in order for your employees to use it. So if you have got an opportunity to harmonize or simplify your approach, um, I could strongly probably recommend uh, you doing the time to do that. Um, in terms of checking, um, compatibility, so really important for us because we were looking at that mobile piece. We had to make sure that when we launched the program, our employees could actually get onto the platform from any mobile device, both internally and externally. So um, your internal platforms, so to make sure that your firewall is, that firewall is not going to block access to uh, the systems that you're trying to launch. And then last but not least, in terms of what to do well, you've gone through all the hard work. You've got your, your platform there. Communication's really key. Um, if you don't tell anybody about the fantastic kind of platform that you've developed, you're not going to necessarily get the engagement uh, with employees. And then ultimately feeding back that return on investment into your senior leadership, uh, leadership group so they can hopefully see uh, what a fantastic job that you've done. Brilliant. Thanks, Nadine. Ken, what are your experiences? Hi. Um, well, if I talk just generally first, I mean, over the years at EasyJet, I've seen three new benefits um, platforms going in, two new share plans. We're just in the process of implementing Workday as a, as a HR system. We've got a new payroll system coming up. Next year, we've got a, another a pension platform going in. So there's a constant sort of series of things that are of technology. So what I wanted to do was just pick an example of a fairly sort of simple uh, implementation that we did a couple of years ago when we put in place a new pension fund. And we, we put that in place primarily because of the government changes in 2015. So those of you in pensions will probably be familiar with it. And what we were, we were doing was re replacing a popular but um, complicated pension uh, scheme, and certainly in terms of charging arrangements, with one that was much, much simpler. And we wanted to use the opportunity, given that the pension reforms were around at the same time, to enable people to get much uh, better information about what their choices were at retirement and the sort of things that they needed to think about along the way. So we put, we put in place the new platform, and there's probably three key areas that I focus on that I think that made that, that a success. And they're not rocket science. I mean, the first one really was a, a very good relationship with our um, suppliers. We had a, a pension administrator and a fund manager, uh, Aegon. And uh, what we did right up front was uh, agree why it was they were making the changes, what the sort of key objectives that, that we had, and how we would measure what success would look like at the end, so that we're all effectively on the same page and sort of had an equal share in what was, what was happening. Secondly, we had a, a, a really effective plan that I mean, we were fortunate we'd got a fair amount of time before we had to implement. So we had a, a long-term plan. We had a very good uh, project manager that was provided by one of the, the, the suppliers. We had weekly calls just to, in terms of progress, just to see where, where we were. So everyone was very clear at every stage where, 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 where we'd got to, and we'd built contingency for things coming up into that. And then just to reinforce, perhaps, as the, as the other panelists have said, communication is absolutely the, the key. So from the early days of talking to the board and the senior stakeholders in the company, our sort of finance people, payroll, internal communications, and what have you, through as the pl plan developed, talking to our uh, employee representative um, groups, providing line manager briefing, and providing things in a number of different sort of media so that people could uh, readily get access. We had a sort of a central hub where any information about the change was, uh, was placed. We had um, frequently asked questions, which are regularly updated. And we were happy to include sort of like warts and all questions uh, as they arose and to sort of demonstrate that everything was, uh, was being, being an answered. Um, we had a small amount of uh, robo-advice as well that we were beginning to introduce at that, that stage. And we had a dedicated helpline or help desk um, service. So a wide sort of variety of communication. Um, in terms of uh, sort of learnings and, and, and things to, uh, to avoid, well, I guess uh, one is, just to re reinforce uh, J Jamie's point, not just introducing things for the, for the sake of them, be very clear about why it is that you want to, to, to do something 
uh, and that what you're, you're planning is going to work for that, uh, for that purpose. Um, sec um, secondly, uh, just in terms of uh, surprises, I mean, we all try and avoid surprises as we go along. Uh, we, you, you'll never achieve that, but, but um, plan, make that time to plan for things that you know are likely to happen, building contingency um, to be able to, um, to, um, to, to, to avoid that. And um, I, I guess just uh, as far as you can, take into account the views of people who are actually going to be using whatever it is you're providing at the end and try and look at things from your end user's point of view. So I think that's perhaps the sort of key um, learning points that I took from those. Fantastic. Thanks, Ken. Fiona, would you like to share about your hub? Yes. Um, I suppose over the last 10 years or so, I've been involved in the implementation of five or six different systems, um, HR systems, performance systems, and benefit systems. Um, but I'll talk about our most recent implementation, um, because I think it's most relevant to what we're discussing here today. We had a benefits system in place. It had been in place for a number of years. Um, it had initially been very well received, very high usage, but over time it had dropped off. And we started to think that actually it was something wrong with the benefits themselves and they were no longer of interest and we needed to engage with the audience and find out you know, what had changed, what was different, what were they actually looking for. We're a technology company ourselves, so it was natural for us to go to our customers. We've talked a lot here today about your employees being your customers. But to actually find out from them what they felt about our existing system, what were they looking for, and to get their feedback from that very early stage. And we were actually quite surprised at what we heard. Um, and it just really highlights everything that's been discussed today in terms of talk, talk to your employees. What they told us was that we had a fantastic benefits scheme, fantastic offering. Um, but actually, it was in different systems. The benefits were in one place. Our wellbeing program was in another place. All of the fantastic um, corporate social responsibility stuff and giving back somewhere else yet again. Um, and it wasn't easy for them to consume. If you think about how people are using technology today, they have all these fantastic experiences using their um, mobile devices, etc., outside of work, then they come into work and they use some clunky old system that we almost impose on them. They need to feel that they're having that same experience that they have outside of work if they're going to use it. So. We really went to the market looking for something that was going to engage them, excite them, something that they really wanted to use, something they feel quite passionate about, and that gave them all of that flexibility to access everything from their mobile devices, from home, from on different sites. We've got six different offices in the UK and overseas, so it, wherever they were, they needed that easy access. Um, we selected a provider that gave us a platform that we could use that could bring all of that together that addressed all of those issues, but also gave us a lot of flexibility and control over what we could actually put into the system, how frequently we could change it, update it, um, and expand um, and grow over time. It was also important to us that the provider we selected had a great roadmap um, and was constantly innovating because technology does change all of the time. So you need to be very careful in whatever you implement today is going to grow and change um, with your needs over the future. You might not know now what those needs are going to be, but you need to be sure that your provider that you're working with is going to be able to adapt to those changing needs over time. It's a big upheaval otherwise to move somewhere completely different. Um, we decided to work with um, Reward Gateway. You've heard today from Dominic, who showed us the Boom platform, um, and from Rai, um, and uh, we're continuing to expand and grow uh, our platform uh, day to day. In hindsight, what would I do differently? Well, we decided that um, people consume information in lots of different ways. If you think that they learn in different ways, they also digest their information in different ways. So the platform that we've used now has a lot of um, video content, it has social media content, it has high level information and it has detailed information. So depending on what ways people want to access the information and what level of information they require, it is there. Um, I think if I was implementing this again, I would get my marketing team involved much earlier on 
um, I've sort of learned uh, throughout the implementation and ongoing um, progression of the system to, to involve them much, much more. And if they're engaged and excited by it, they're, they're, they're your creative team, so they come up with much better ideas than you do. Thank you, Fiona. And uh, last but not least, Caroline, tell us what you've been doing. What did you do last summer? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is working. Yes, oh, yes it is. Um, so obviously over the past sort of 15, nearly 20 years in rewards, I've implemented or been involved in the implementations of many tools. Most recently um, at Bloomberg, we went live over the summer with Workday. Um, we have nearly 20,000 employees in 72 countries globally, so a really big feat. And um, as you all know, working in benefits, benefits is a huge chunk of that, multiple benefits in each country and specific to each country. Um, so obviously thinking through these things, that was at the forefront of my mind. But I think that you know, most of what I say rings true for you know, any project. Um, my um, colleagues up here have um, spoken to the importance of you know, identifying stakeholders, getting them in place you know, early on in the stage. And I would m say even important to get them there at the vendor tool selection stage, just to make sure that it really can do what um, you're being sold. Um, it may look nice and shiny and you know, some people are less technical. They might be a little dazzled by how pretty and shiny it is, may choose to go for that and then all of a sudden you get to the point where you've made a decision and you involve the technical team who go, well, we can't build those interfaces or it doesn't work with your HRIS and you may then end up with a system that's not fit for purpose. You're kind of trying to patch things up to make it work. So really getting the key stakeholders involved early on. And again, the technology people, payroll for us is a really big one. Um, legal, I mean, we deal in personal information. Uh, we deal in transferring that information um, to vendors. And it is you know, absolutely key that um, you have legal data privacy experts there that can you know, sort of validate that whatever you're putting in place is something that is going to work, that is going to be correct. Um, the other thing, again, um, Launching Workday would not have been a success if the regional teams had not been represented. Um, EMEA in itself has um, 42 of our 72 countries. Um, and the reason it was successful is that the regional teams were at the table, were considered equal stakeholders, and were involved from the onset. Um, you know, one size doesn't fit all in these situations, and if you're involved later on in the process, you're just gonna be spending a lot of time building workarounds, et cetera. So certainly one of my key tips is, if you know there's a project going on and it's being worked at a corporate or somewhere you're not involved in, shout, jump, kick doors in, whatever you need to do, it will be a lot less painful to get yourself to the table than to deal with the consequences of not having been there um, down the road. Um, so I think you know those are really um, some of the key elements. Um, I think allowing time for testing, really thinking who's going to be using this, you know, in what capacity are they going to be using this? If you take um, Workday, for instance, it's an HR tool, it's a management tool, it's an employee tool. You want each of those different groups to be managing and testing that tool to make sure that it works for them in their capacity. Because if you just make it work for two out of those three or four or five groups, you haven't had, you know, a successful um, rollout of the program. Um, the other key thing is, you know, rolling the tool out, that's not the end. It's the, you know, end of the beginning, but, you know, that's when a lot of the hard work continues um, in terms of sometimes theory and reality don't necessarily match up. You thought it would work like that. You thought it would be received like that. You thought employees or managers would use it this way, but in fact, that's not how they're using it. So what do you do with that? How do you adjust to that reality? Um, vendors change. You might not always keep the same medical provider and legislation may change. Vendors may get acquired. Things out of your control may happen. And how do you manage these changes throughout the ongoing life cycle of the tool? It really is, you know, something like an employee database or a flexible platform it really is a living thing. Um, and of course, as all of my colleagues here said, communication is important. Why spend all that time, effort, energy on something if you're not going to tell people about it and get you know, them to use it? Um, yeah, and I think that a lot of the kind of pitfalls, again, for me, one of the key things that I think we could have done a much better job at is 
um, process mapping and role and responsibility definition. Um, you know, we knew how things used to work and we knew who used to do them. And we went into the process and we still knew these things needed to be done, perhaps not as clearly how they were gonna happen and then who was actually responsible for ensuring that they did happen. And, and I think those are where we, we saw quite a few of the gaps and the problems and some of the things that we're actually still um, ironing out um, for the moment. Thank you. So, really interesting sort of some similarities but also some differences in the experiences. I think it'd be good now to get the Slido questions up because I've seen some really good ones coming through. That was the bit that panels always think, oh, am I going to be able to answer this? Um, and the first, the top most popular one I've been watching that come on my phone, is there too much focus on trying to find one solution to fit all needs and ultimately what do... Perhaps what we really need is providers to be flexible to work together at a lower cost. So is that one size, that, that one solution really what we should be going for? Is there a different way of looking at it? Ken, have you got a thought on that? I think um, when, when you've got multiple sort of platforms and different countries and whatever else, the idea of having simplicity and everything on one platform sounds fantastic. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a place to start and things like sort of Workday, the opportunity to get a sort of starting point to maybe to consolidate a number of things. But realistically, one solution isn't going to fit all of those, and it isn't going to work for, for, for everything. So there will be things that you'll still need to, to, to do separately. But perhaps if your starting point is that you're trying to make things as simple as you can, and then you're looking for what the best value is for other systems, perhaps that's a sort of a decent, um, decent place to start. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jane, yeah. I think part of the answer to that question is also um, whether the provider that's um, offering the one-size-fits-all solution actually does all of the things that they say they do with expertise. Um, because often you get um, benefits programs which will do five or six different things, um, but actually one or two of them aren't done to the standard or to the level or to the requirements that you actually need. And sometimes, therefore, it is better to um, have two different providers, each specializing in their area of expertise, but to make sure, as the question implies, that those providers work together and integrate properly and to bring those together. I definitely think that's, that's correct. I want to move into the next question because there's a lot of questions coming up here that would be worth answering. The next one, technology is moving fast, so what can we do to make sure the prov provider's future roadmap is agile? You know, they're often reluctant to be specific for fear of over-promising. So you know, as reward people, as HR people, maybe working through IT teams, what, you know, how, how have you managed to ensure that you're future-proofing yourself by what you're buying today? Um, I think for me, it was taking um, perhaps smaller steps, so not necessarily over-promising in our projects. So when we went out to employees and asked them what they would like to see, I think we pretty much got everything on the kitchen sink uh, on that list. And it was just about being realistic and saying, what can we deliver now and what perhaps is going to come further down the, the road and working then with our providers to put those incremental steps in place rather than a big bang approach and then being left with, what do I do now? What is the next, uh, next steps? So that, that was it for me. Fiona, you look like you've got a view on that. Yes, I think um, as long as you're comfortable that the organisation that you're working with is constantly innovating, you don't have to know what the next steps need to be. You don't need to be the ones coming up with all the ideas. They're the experts and they'll be out there doing all of that research and coming with, to you with ideas um, and suggestions or getting you involved in, in that journey. I think you just need to be confident that they are thinking about those things and they aren't actually complacent with the current product that, and offering that they have. Going back to the previous point about the various different systems, I think it's, it really comes down to the user's experience. The employees don't actually care if it's multiple systems. They just want it to be easy to access and easy to use. So if you've got a platform that has links to other different systems, um, you can bring together experts from, from various different areas. But for the employee, they're just channeling everything through one point of access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, next que popular question, who's the best place to deliver fantastic communications? Is it the supplier provider you're working with, or is it your in-house team? Where are you going to get the best comms from? 
would say a, a partnership. I think that um, you know very clearly if you just leave it up to the provider, they don't have the level of insight and understanding of culture of your company and you know how you work and you you know as an op as a how you operate as an organization. So I think that um, leaving it simply to their hands, it may very well mean that they miss the mark. That being said, they have fantastic resources. Often when you buy a product that's included in the price, you'd be foolish not to take full advantage of that. But you really do need to make sure that it's a partnership with your internal comms and, and you know, benefits team, HR, etc. Mm -hmm. So that you're leveraging each other. We have the, sir, we have the internal knowledge um, and we understand our culture and the vendors are the subject matter expert when it comes to the product that they're selling and they have resources. Mm -hmm. So I think you really need to leverage both as much as you can. Ken, you look like you've got something to say. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. The, a partnership is, is best. I mean, internally, you'll have your own sort of brand, you'll have your own way of doing things, you'll know what your audiences are. But hopefully, you let the supplier do most of the work and have your sort of internal communications team, you know, overseeing it and providing that sort of framework. That's probably the ideal scenario. Oh, Jamie may not agree. But. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another question. Sometimes HR are not the best people to scope out a new system, uh, new system requirements before going to market. What are the pitfalls and how can HR learn from IT? I think I alluded to that a, a little earlier on and I think that absolutely, you know, in HR we are not systems experts or most of us aren't. We don't necessarily understand file feeds, databases, interfaces um, and how all of these things may sit with each other and feed into our HR, for our, into a payroll, etc. So I think that there is absolutely truth in when you're trying to define what you want, what you need, what are the specifications of what you're looking for? Absolutely, I think, you know, involve your IT department. They will be able to tell you whether um, what you're looking for is realistic or not. Is it something that your systems can accommodate? Um, you'll also have to rely on them because they're very busy, you know, they're not just sitting around waiting for you to um, be in the mood to implement a new tool. Um, you know, there's a resource issue, there's a knowledge issue, absolutely. So, um, and this goes back to this having the right people in the room to make sure that when you do select something, it is fit for purpose. You're not, you know, doing a sort of sales support system that turns out can't, you know, interface with your HR database. And so it looks really pretty and fancy. And if it had been able to, to, to do that, it would have been absolutely amazing, but it can't. So now what are we doing to manage that in the background? So yes, absolutely, you know, humility, you're, you need the help of others and you need to pull in the subject matter experts. I would just add that from a, from a provider's perspective, it's our responsibility to, um, to help that process along the way and, and that you as a, an organization should be looking to providers who can demonstrate in the initial sort of, you know, tendering process, if that's what you're doing to get a provider, um, that they have expertise in making those recommendations, that they know um, what resource you're going to need to commit to the project and they can advise because they've done this project many, many times and you perhaps haven't and you may not realize that there are some parts of your organization that need to be involved. You should look to the provider to, to assist with that, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other top tips on dealing with your IT department from any of the others on the panel? Buy them chocolate. Sorry? Buy them chocolate. Buy them chocolate. <laughs> that always works really, really well. <laughs> yeah, bribery definitely works. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to wrap up at that point, if that's OK. I always like to wrap up slightly early, because I always find people appreciate that. So I want to say a very, very big thank you to all of our panellists here today. Do so you give them a round of applause? <laughs>